Hello from Poland, Oregon. I'm Aki Nakanishi. I'm the Arlen Shinisa Curator of Culture, Art and Education at the Japan Institute. That was a mouthful, but wherever you might be joining us from, it gives us a great pleasure to be hosting this webinar series, Living Traditions. Through this unique coast-to-coast -coast partnership with our respective friends at Japan Society in New York City, bridged and facilitated by the government of Japan, we have thoroughly enjoyed working closely with Japan Society to produce this five-part webinar series in its second year running. It is second year running, yeah. Throughout this series, we seek to unravel the historical journeys of some of the most iconic facets of Japanese culture through conversations between thought-provoking experts and cultural stewards on how they maintain deep-rooted traditions in the present day. And today, while well, I'm kind of sad to say that it, it is our fifth and last iteration in this season, I'm very excited to say that we'll be discussing Japanese design. So I just wonder what conjures up in your mind when you hear the term Japanese design? Would that be something along the lines of elaborate kimono garments or meticulously raked or manicured gardens or could that be the lavish composition of ukiyo-e woodblock prints? Whatever that might be, in this vast arena of design today, we will look at Japan's journey of, let's say, self-discovery um, through design history with the intention of spinning the thread all the way from the dawn of Japanese modern design through the ages of post-war turbulence and abundance during the um, booming era and the maturity stage where the contemporary voices often call for going back to basics. And for that profound discussion, we couldn't think of a better panel and a moderator, whom I'm just simply honored to welcome to the stage in a minute. Linking amazingly five international cities around the world. We have Portland, New York, Tokyo, Melbourne, and Honolulu all coming together live, and this is just incredible. Anyway, before that, I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce a couple of pivotal books around which today's episode revolves. And um, one is sitting right here, this uh, rather petite looking white book called Just Enough Design. Reflection on the Japanese philosophy of Odo Hodo by one of our today's speakers and one of Japan's most celebrated designers alive, Paku Sato. And this book was edited and translated by our moderator today, Linda Hogland. So today, we are very fortunate to have both of them present to scoop up the very essence of the book in a very interactive way. And um, embellishing the conversation, with even more substance and historical overview of um, Japan's design history is precisely this book called Designing Modern Japan, written by the other speaker today, Professor Sarah Teasley. Now, I can't go into too much detail right now, of course, but this is another critical book that would give you a huge insight into the holistic overview of the journey from the mid 18th century to the present day just dissecting so many important layers of Japan's cultural as well as intellectual development from the design perspective. So just in case you're interested, I'll be remiss not to put the links in the chat box. So there you are. Hopefully you are seeing the uh, links right now. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to call on the moderator to the virtual podium. She's a filmmaker, subtitler, and translator active in the arts and culture, to say the very least having collaborated consistently with the likes of Hayao Miyazaki, Ishuichi Miyako, Issei Miyake, Tadao Ando, and Takashi Murakami, just to name a few of those cultural giants from Japan. She's one of the most prolific and influential cultural producers active in bridging Japan with the world. Her recent feature-length documentary called Edo Avant-Garde sets out to explore some of the most innovative aspects of the Edo period of Japanese artists, and how their trailblazing visions and techniques change the way we interact with art as well as nature. Our very good friend, Linda Hogland, I feel so blessed to have you here with us as a moderator today. And thank you so very much for taking this on. And Linda, this is, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Aki, for your kind introduction and for hosting this webinar. The roots of uh, contemporary Japanese design can be traced back to Japan's Edo era, which lasted from the early 1600s to the late 1860s. 
For nearly two and a half centuries, Japan largely isolated itself from the world and prospered in peace. But Edo era isolation also had the inadvertent effect of postponing Japan's industrialization until the 1870s, nearly one century after factories began transforming daily life and material culture in Europe and the US. Until the late 19th century, artisans called shokunin painstakingly made everything by hand, from textiles to tatami mats, from brooms to umbrellas, all beautifully designed to be integrated into the practical functions of daily life. Today, the legacy of shokunin material culture remains evident in many aspects of Japanese life and design. Our presenters, Sarah Teasley and Takusato, will explore the continuing relevance of this history on Japanese design, aesthetics, and values. Before I introduce our first speaker, we look forward to your questions throughout this session. Please post them directly into the chat box during the two presentations and during the interactive portion of the program. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Now we'll start the program with Professor Sarah Teasley's 15 minute presentation. Professor Sarah Teasley is a social historian of design currently Professor of Design at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, recognized for her expertise in Japan's design culture. She is the author of Designing Modern Japan and co-editor of Design and Society in Modern Japan and Global Design History. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, Aki. And thank you to everyone um, at Japan Society and Japanese uh, Portland Japanese Garden um, and all the sponsors of the event as well. It's an honor to join the conversation and to have the chance to engage more deeply with your ideas, Takusan, especially in the forum today. Slide, please. And next slide, please. I'll begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the unceded lands and waters from which I'm joining you today. As an uninvited guest, it's my responsibility to follow the protocols and expectations of the traditional owners, um, which includes acknowledging um, their ownership and that I will follow those laws. Sovereignty here has never been ceded and I pay my respects to elders past and present I also thank them for their ongoing care for country and all beings here. And I also pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands from which you're joining us, including the many tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River in what's now Portland, Oregon, and the Lenape of what's now New York City. Next slide, please. Our conversation today is about cultural and aesthetic aspects of design in Japan. You may have your own thoughts already of what this is. It may have to do with skill and attention to craft, detail and finish that have gone into designing and producing objects, the spaces or the experience. It could be about knowing how much is enough, knowing how far to push aspects like the finish, the form, the scale, the weight in the hand or the look on the page to be optimal for experience. It could be about a carefully considered corner typography that spaces letters across the page, making the act of reading a quiet delight. A shop interior that helps you imagine a new way of being, or the cut of a jacket, just so, with tailoring that you'd not have imagined, but brings quiet pleasure and surprise every time you put it on. The delight of Japanese design could be about drawing on forms, patterns, materials, or object types from the design of earlier periods, recasting these into items for life today. And a good example here is tenungri, small pattern printed woven cotton cloths that you can use as towels, as headbands, as table decorations, and so many other things. Once they were ubiquitous, then in the late 20th century, they were replaced by new items from synthetic materials, but they're popular again now for their connection to the past, their enticing colors and prints, and the playfulness that they bring. And far from minimalist simplicity and truth to materials, Japanese design and its pleasures could be about the way that information graphic and text are deployed across packaging to catch attention on the shelf or the web page, 
Some design products in Japan stand out for myriad variations, like 300 different kinds of toothpaste on the shelf in a drugstore, where they're not completely different, but slight variations in the product that, are, that then appear in the communication design of the packaging through discrete variations in color and language, creating a real panoply of options that in a beautiful assemblage. Or it could be about the care that some designers and critics in Japan have taken to promote design as something that adds value to everyday life, to culture, to well-being and the economy. And the way that designers and critics, including Takusan, share their ideas with diverse publics in Japan through books and magazines, exhibitions, television and radio, public building projects and graphic publicity campaigns, to name a few media. For the past 150 years, designers in Japan have also worked eloquently to describe the deep-rooted traditions that designers in Japan draw on in their work today. And I want to acknowledge Takusan's writing and also the work with organizations like 2121 Design Site, the work with NHK and Designa and other public media for their thoughtful, tangible contribution, connecting thought with design process, creativity in everyday life. And I'd also like to note here the work of my colleague um, at RMIT, Yoko Akama, who also uh, carefully articulates design in relation to concepts like ma, and from whom I learn a lot um, every day here in Melbourne. Today, I'll complement these reflections on Japanese design with some thoughts about design as emerging from particular historical conditions. These have to do with the drive to create and innovate that motivates designers, regardless of their social circumstances, and the ways in which, if we think about design practice, designers find a way to create through, uh, through changing circumstances wherever they are and however they can, right? So that real creative drive. I think this is also about something that Linda's already touched on, which is that Japan from the early modern period has had a highly competitive urban marketplace. Um, diverse consumer groups all wanting the latest and best things. And the practice that designers have had as a result in creating objects to compete in that crowded marketplace. There's something about forms, materials and techniques and circulation, what your community makes, what you know how to do and what you think might be better and what the materials and the techniques afford you to do. And finally, the deep care and commitment to supporting one's community, whether that's a neighborhood, family, a town, or the entire country that runs through so much work um, in design in Japan. So these, we might call them sort of ec um, economic, environmental, and social conditions that I would also say deeply shape the practice and products of design in Japan today. So we're going to have a real whistle-stop tour of some of these points, and we're going to spend a bit more time in the earlier periods, because my argument, like Linda's, is that the conditions and the dispositions of several hundred years ago continue to shape how understandings of design and opportunities for design in Japan now. Uh, slide, please. So Linda mentioned um, just the importance of craftspeople making diverse objects in the early modern period. Um, this is the artist Hokusai's uh, depiction of, or sorry, the artist Hiroshige's depiction of weavers in Kawachi Nangono outside Osaka in the early modern period. And already you can see um, this is one of a number of prints that um, created, but just the diversity of types of practice, you know, sort of the fine ways in which different people are working in different aspects of production. And as part of a series in this image, if you look at sort of the different textile prints, you can see the importance of fashionability, right? Of standing out, of being part of one's class or one's community and conforming to expectations about how one dresses, but also playing with fashion and the importance of selling products or creating products that will appeal to consumers. And that gives designers an opportunity to stand out, an opportunity to play. Next slide, please. There's a, textiles are a really important part of the Japanese economy and as such give so many opportunities for designers. Um, this is just one image of how um, important the market was and the idea of consumers, you know, elite consumers, um, but poorer people as well in cities saying, well, what, what, what could we have? What are the latest fashions? And the importance of shopping and driving this economy, which gives designers the chance to create. Next slide, please. 
um, Linda noticed the importance of understanding Japan as a very closed off place from the world, but it was also a place, and it has been for hundreds of years, in which ideas from the outside circulate and become fashionable in their own right. So already in the early modern period, fashions from India and from Europe were coming in. And there was a real trend, for example, for what was what's called sarasa, um, which is pattern designs for cloth, um, for printing, for all sorts of things that are coming from India. Um, and these were these were written up into um, into design books um, called Hinagata Bon that were printed in the hundreds, if not thousands, and could be circulated around. So des ideas of design um, weren't just accessible by designers, but you had beautiful designed objects in your everyday life. People even in you know, poor rural villages would take care in thinking about how do you craft something that brings beauty into your life? And there are these amazing luxury goods um, accessible as well. Next slide, please. Hinagata Bon are an important part of designers' livelihood, um, created by incredibly important artists, including Skenobu, um, Hokusai, Hiroshige, many of the famous print artists we know were working in, um, in pattern design for textiles, but these could be applied across objects. And like I said, they circulated through print media um, so that people who weren't designers could also enjoy the visuals. Next slide, please. We know that Japan changed a lot with industrialization in the late 19th century with new technologies, new transportation, new communication, new forms of jobs, um, and new ways of dressing, living, eating, and relating to the world. One of the key points here for designers is that this was also a massive economic shock. The cotton, the bottom fell out of the cotton industry, the bottom fell out of textile industries more widely. Um, the, bottom, the bottom fell out of ceramics, it fell out of many of the industries that, that had allowed designers to be so creative in the early modern period. So what did designers do? They Savvy designers reshaped their practices and found new markets. Next slide, please. One good example here is in ceramics, where ceramics, some ceramics creators for example, from Arita in southern Japan, which remains a very important region today, thought about new markets like the overseas market, these vases which were sent to Philadelphia, in which the, um, the designers took away the usual, the gold, the red, the brightness of Arita, left the milky white surface and some of the decorations and added hand painting techniques collaborating with the kiln in Tokyo for these really lifelike carp. So ways of, I think this is such an important point, point and it's something I really go into in the book around how designers use um, very challenging economic conditions or social conditions to find new ways to thrive. And this is something that we again see in design today um, in Japan. Next slide, please. And here's to this is just an example of the kinds of products that designers were sending overseas um, in, you know, in this turbulent moment in the late 19th century in Japan, when the bottom had dropped out of the market, designers had lost their livelihood and needed to move very, very quickly. Um, next slide, please. There was a lot of important government backing and government promotion in this period, but I'm going to note that again, this was people who were designers figuring out so people with a knack for design who could go into government and start supporting local communities. So there's a lot of work um, that continues today in Japan around exhibitions, publishing, design education, and sharing design ideas with wide and diverse publics that begins in the late 19th century. Um, the federal government, the national government ran five major exhibitions of design. Um, this is one of them showcasing the fantastic projects and products from different regions across Japan, many products that are still around with us today, many of them important craft traditions. Next slide, please. The government, um, so designers working for and with the Japanese government traveled the world looking at emerging trends in design fashion, whether that was um, Chinese ceramics from the Qing dynasty, or um, things like um, walking stick handles from the Netherlands and the types of novel products that were on sale in important markets for Japanese design exports. Next slide, please. Um, this is designers worked with the government um, to create museums or product exhibition halls where the general public and people in exports or people in Japan could go and visit and learn about good design. This is the, um, the, the Ministry of Agriculture and Commerce's product exhibition hall in Tokyo in 1900. It had thousands of visitors a year. Next slide. 
but this was replicated around Japan. Um, records from Shizuoka Prefecture show that, um, again, thousands of people were visiting their product exhibition halls, some to buy, some to learn about good design, some to think about new materials or techniques, and some for classes or lectures or sharing knowledge about traditional methods and traditional techniques like lacquerware. Next slide, please. Design education was incredibly important from the late 19th century and in key, really key schools that continue to play a central role in design practice in Japan today, like what's now the um, Tokyo National Uni Tokyo University of the Arts um, and Tokyo Institute of Technology got their starts then. Designers who'd been trained in traditional painting techniques in the early modern period um, traveled internationally and became teachers at these institutes, teaching both traditional painting techniques and um, adapting European and Indian and various techniques around designing into their methods. Next slide, please. These were shared very widely with publics, including women who couldn't go to design schools at the time or who were limited to particular tracks. Um, these illustrations from a fantastic book from the early 20th century um, by one of the professors, by one by a by a design school professor, were circulated particularly for women. Um, and again, these were printed in the thousands and reprinted um, six or seven times. The idea being that you could sketch and then go from a sketch to a beautiful surface pattern. And this was recommended as something that everyone could do: children, women, regardless of your regardless of your age or class. Next slide, please. And this access to design was replicated throughout the education system, whether it was education for girls, um, learning to be teachers in, re in um, the regions around Japan, or whether it was young people, um, boys and girls who had to work, who had to go out and work rather than going to school, but could go to night school and learn designing practices there. Next slide. I talked about competition and just the diverse, the many, many products um, that were available in Japan. And in the late 19th century, you know, we might think of Japan now as very, very rich in the types of products. I talked about 300 kinds of toothpaste. Well, that was the same back then. This is just one example of the types of products that a well-off girl might have in her house. All of these needed designers and the design systems available in the period meant that people who wanted to design could find ways to design in their own ways and create beautiful products like this. There was a market in place for them. There were materials and techniques coming in from overseas, available from tradition as well. There was a deeply competitive market that meant people had to innovate. And there was a demand for design and, and different communities of designers. I will stop there. I could keep going, but I think I've made the point. So over to you, Linda, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your presentation, your whistle-stop tour of uh, the history of design and innovation in Japan, highlighting the central role that design has played over the centuries of in people's lives and imaginations and the amazing adaptability of Japanese designers to the vagaries of historical circumstances. I'd now like to introduce Taku Sato, who is a prolific, highly respected designer whose iconic works include the graphic design for Issei Miyake's Please Please and the art direction for the renowned and beloved children's TV program, Nihongo de Asobo. You can watch some episodes on YouTube if you're interested. An amazingly sophisticated program about art and Japanese language for children. Taku is also a founding director of Japan's Design Museum 2121 Design Site and the author of multiple books. Takusam, we look forward to your presentation. Hello, I'm Sato Taku. Uh, as you explained in my introduction, I do a, a variety of different kinds of work. And today, because we don't have so much time, I want to focus on one particular uh, aspect. あの、それはあの、先ほどもちょっとご紹介していただいた今度あの、昨年アメリカで出た本で、え、本のキーワードになってる日本のキーワードなんですけれども。
Uh, so uh, a, a moment ago, uh, uh, the book that was published last year was introduced, and there's a certain keyword uh, about that book. In Japanese, there's the word hodo hodo. Hodo hodo という言葉の意味はですね、やりすぎないっていうことですね。And the meaning of that word is not to overdo it. えー、少し手前で、えー、とどめておくという意味があります。To stop just a little bit before you think、uh, the whole thing might be completed. あの日本では子供の時にですね、遊び遊ぶ遊んでいるとですね、えー、親からあのほどほどにしなさいっていうふうにあの怒られたりもあのするわけです。For instance, when children are playing in Japan, the parents might say, ほどほど、just do it ほどほど。In other words, don't overdo it. ゲームとかをやりすぎていてですね、親からのゲームばっかりやってるんじゃないっていうふうに言われるときに、まあ、ほどほどにしなさいなんて言われるわけです、ね。For instance, if the child is doing playing games, then they, the parent might say, yeah, don't, don't, don't do too much, know when to stop. であの長いこと、まあ、デザインの仕事をしてきて、このほどほどという言葉に、えー、含まれる深い意味を感じるようになりました。なのでなので、それがあの日本のデザインにおいて、そこここに、えーえー、見,見受けられる、えー、日本の伝統的なデザインにおいて、そこここに見受けられると思うようになりました。Yeah, and, and well. えー、その代表的なあの例がですね、えー、皆様がご存知のものなんですが、まず一つ目、二つあるんですけれども、一つ目は、Hashi, this name. Okay. So,、uh, one very good example I think many people are familiar with uh, is uh, the Japanese chopsticks. I think we need the slide. Hashi no bunka, the sne, Asia, ni, ano, mina san gozonji no yoni, Asia ni hiroku, hiromate imasu. This culture of chopsticks actually is、uh, spread very wide in Asia. Des kere do mo, Nihon no hashi wa desne, saki ga no to temo hosoi. いいものが多いんですね。In Japan, the Japanese chopsticks, the, the ends, the tips are very, very、uh, narrow.、えー、とてもあの丁寧にあの先が細く作られているものが多いです。It's very, very sophisticatedly and carefully made to have this very, very narrow, slim tip. で、えー、この細い先によって、えー、ご飯粒、ご飯粒一つ。をですね、つまんで最後まで、えー、食べることができます。For instance, because of this, you know, thinness, this, this, this point, it makes it possible to eat even a single grain of rice, to eat all the rice down to the very last grain. で、皆さんご存知のように、あの麺類ですね、えー、ヌードル、ヌードルなんかも食べる,食べるわけです、ね。And also it's possible to eat noodles. それから、柔らかい食べ物であれば、えー、2つに切り分ける、切り分ける。ためにもこの日本の箸でを使います。And also, Japanese chopsticks are easy to use if you want to divide something, something soft.、えー、たった日本の棒をなので、えー、なんですけれども、そのいろいろな使い方をまあ当たり前のようにあのするわけですね。Uh, and this is just simply two two sticks, but with this, it makes it possible to do a, a lot of different things. つまり、えー、人間の人間の側が持っているその力、能力、能力というものを、えー、この日本の棒をが引き出しているということも言えます。In fact, these two sticks are drawing out from、uh, us people our, our abilities. 日本の棒で先が細い日本の棒をだからゆえに、えー、いろいろな人間がその工夫をすることができるわけですね。And they also make it possible for lots of different people to、uh, arrange it or to, to modify the use based on their own personal needs. 
もう一つの例はですね、フロシキです。Uh, next slide, please. Another example is the Furoshiki. えー、風呂敷もあのご存知の方が多いと思いますけれども、一枚の布ですね。I think a lot of、uh, people under, know the Furoshiki, but it's a single piece of cloth.、えー、正方形の一枚の布なんですが、えー、この正方形の布、一枚の布なの、えー、なですけれども、えー、いろいろな形のものを、まあ、包むことができる。It's just a simple square piece of cloth,、uh, but it makes it possible to do a lot of different forms. えー、包むことができるだけではなくて、持ち運べるわけです。You can use it to wrap something, of course, but you can also use it to carry things.、えー、この種類がですね、えー、もう60種類、70種類ぐらい、いろいろな形のものを包む包み方というものがあります。There's, you know,、uh, 50 or 60 or, or even more、uh, different ways to use the Furoshiki to, to wrap and carry things. ワインのボトルを2本、えーえー、包んで運ぶこともできます。You can、uh, carry two bottles of wine with it. えー、大きなスイカを一個、えー、運ぶこともできます。You can carry one watermelon with it. えー、これもあの先ほどの、えー、箸と同じように、えー、と一枚の布っていう,うそのとてもシンプルな、えー、ものをゆえに、えー、人間の持ってる能力が引き出されるということですね。Uh, and just like with the chopsticks, it, this simple piece of cloth actually draws out from people their own abilities, their own、uh, you know, uh, 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 thinking, their own possibilities. でこの一枚の布の生地、生地ですね。生地はものすごくいろいろなこだわった素晴らしいあの生地がいっぱいあり,あります。And in this, the, the textile itself, the fabric itself, there's a lot of attention paid to it. でそこにはグラフィックがつけることができるわけですね。For instance, it can be a graphic design. でもそれ以上はしないわけです。えー、と包むためにもっと便利にする、持ちやすくするために手を。手を入れる穴を入れつけるとかそういうことはしないわけです。そういったこともできないわけです。そういったこともできないわけです。そういったことないわけです。そういったこともできないわけです。そういったこともでやるわけですね。And it's because,、uh, in the ほどほど way, it sort of stops at a certain point.、Uh, that's why it has such a high quality. まあ、こ,こういうですね、まあ、こういうあの、えーまあ、この箸も風呂敷もごく日常的にあ,のあるものです。And both the chopsticks and the 風呂敷 are, are daily items. 特別なものではなくて、ごく日常的なものをよく見てみると、そこに、えー、もしかすると、日本の、えー、伝統的なデザインっていうものが、えー、隠れているように思います。And, and I think that、uh, it's, it's possible to say that Japanese traditional design thinking is somehow、uh, hidden within or can be discovered within these、uh, daily items. で、私はあの、えー、歴史家でも学者でもありませんから、あのデザイナーあーですので、で実際にじゃあ、えー、その、自分がいたしているところにどう,どういうふうにそれが、えー、顔を出しているのかっていうことをちょっと話してみたいと思います。And I'm a designer, I'm not a historian or an academic, but I do want to talk about、um, you know, how these ideas emerge from what I'm doing. あの常にあの夜なんていうか歴史を伝統をですね考えてあのデザインしているわけではないんですね。I'm not necessarily thinking specifically about traditional design from, from the beginning. ですけれども自然と自然と多分自分の中の深いところにあるそのこの国で育まれた文化っていうものがえにじみ出ているのかもしれません。But I think this,、uh, this traditional culture has sort of suffused through my, my existence because I'm, I'm living here. I'm from Japan. えー、次のスライドをお願いします。あのこれがあの、えー、昔私があの企画をしてあのデザインをしたあ日本のウイスキーです。This is a Japanese whiskey、uh, design that I、uh, did in Japan many years ago.、えー、ウイスキーはあの、えー、スコットランドから、えー、ヨーロッパからですね入ってきたあお酒の文化なわけです。And whiskey is a sort of a culture of alcohol that、uh, arrived from、uh, Scotland and from you know the British Islands.、えー、私がこのデザインに関わる以前はですねあのやはりあのヨーロッパのウイスキーのような、えー、顔をしたあのウイスキーというものがもちろんあの世の中に多く
売られていました私はそのヨーロッパからウイスキーの文化が入ってきて、えー、時間が経っているわけですから日本ならではの,、えーそのえー、解釈によってデザインをしてもいいんじゃないかと思いました。A lot of time had passed since whiskey had first arrived from you know, overseas from Europe、uh, and I thought maybe it was a good time to do something that was specifically Japanese、uh, for whiskey. でこういうあの、えー、ウイスキーを作ったんですね。まずこれは500ミリリットルです。And I designed this、uh, kind of whiskey packaging. This is a 500 milliliter bottle.、えー、通常の,あのウイスキーのサイズと比べると少し小さめですね。It's a little smaller than a normal whiskey bottle.、えー、日本人あの、手の小さい人も多いですから、えー、持ちやすいサイズにしてます。And one reason was I think the hands of Japanese may be a little bit smaller,、uh, and this may be easier for them to, to pick up and, and hold. で、えーこれの特徴的なところはこのボトルのデザインですね。So the bottle design so far is somehow special. えー、デザインをしてないように見えると思います。I think、uh, it, it looks like it's not really designed. It's undesigned. 個性的なデザインをしようと思えばいくらでもまあできるわけですけれども、それをしてないわけですね。If, if, if I wanted to do a very individualized design, it certainly there's a lot of possibilities. でそのことによってどういうことが、えー、可能になるかを次のスライドでご覧いただきたいと思います。Uh, design, possible, 飲んだ後にまた使いたくなるっていうことですね。The idea was that when you're finished drinking it, you still want to use the bottle.、えー、デザインを個性的にしないことによって。えー、また瓶として生まれ変われるっていうことです。And it's because I didn't try to you know, do this very individualized、uh, design that、uh, it's possible for this bottle to be reborn like this. まあ、デザインというのはその何かすることだっていうあのイメージがもちろんあるわけですけれども、その積極的にしないことによって、えー、また別のものに、えー、その使いたくなる気持ちを引き出すっていうことですね。Yeah, and, and again, we think of design as something that is done, but、uh, when we think about what is left undone,、uh, then those possibilities、uh, can be drawn out. There's kind of other ways to use it. で、それはあのパッケージのそういう、そういう考え方はパッケージのどこにも書いてありません。And nothing like that is written on the package itself. それを、それに気がついていただく、それに気がついて、気がつくという喜びをですね、その、えー、逆に言うと、えー、その、えー、こちらから伝えずに気がついていただくということを、前提にか、あの、してるわけですね。Yeah, the basic idea was that people could discover that for themselves.、Uh, they're not being told or shown how to do it. They discover these possibilities themselves. 皆さんもよくいろいろなあの素敵な箱をギフトが届くとその箱をですね箱に何か入れたりとかハンカチを入れたりとかそういうことをすると思うんですね。I think most of us, you know, we reuse nice boxes that we've gotten, you know, put handkerchiefs in them or, or find other ways to use them. えー、皆さん、もったいない、日本のもったいないっていうあの言葉はご存知かもしれません。Some of you may know this concept, もったいない、which is something like、oh, what a waste or don't waste things. そう,いうそういう気持ちをその前提にデザインを考えるとあまりデザインをしない方がいいっていうことです、ね。That's, that's of of kind of えー、まあこういうあのちょっと具体的なあの私のデザインを一つ今日はあの、yeah. お持ちしました。So that's one、uh, specific example of my, my design that I brought today. で、えー、とスライドを次お願いします。でえー、とこれはあの2121デザインサイトというところのシンボルで。This is the symbol design、uh, for the 2121 design site、uh, museum. あのさっきあのサラさんからお話もいただきましたけれども、あの三宅一生さんと一緒にですね、えー、2007年に作った。デザインをの展覧会をする場所です。Uh, and Sarah、uh, mentioned earlier,、uh, this is、uh, an exhibition space for design that、uh, I did with Ise Miyake in 2007. そこであのいろいろなあのテーマのデザインの展覧会をしています。And we do a very, quite a lot of different kinds of design、uh, exhibitions on various themes. デザインとは、この2121っていう意味はですね、えー、と2020っていうのがパーフェクトサイトですね。So this 2121, the meaning behind that is, well, we know 2020 refers to perfect vision. で、2121っていうのは、さらに先ですね
さらに先をデザインの視点で見てみようっていうそういう意味を込めた。And, and the 2121 is sort of implying that we will look beyond that, look to the next step、uh, through design. And ここで、まあ、そのデザインというものはどういうものなのかということを多くの人たちに考えてもらう、まあ、きっかけを,を用意しているいるわけです。And, and the purpose of the, the, the museum is to give an opportunity for people to, to think about various aspects of design. で次のスライドお願いします。Next time. でこ,これはあの子どもたちにそのデザイン教育ですね、えー、子どものためのデザイン教育がとても大切なのではないだろうかという考え方に基づいて行った展覧会です。Uh, this exhibition、uh, is intended as education, design education for children, because I think design education is very important for children. テレビの番組もあの同時にやっております。And at the same time, I was、uh, doing a television program on design for children. で次のスライドは。Next slide, please. これは,まあ先あのこれはまあ今でもあのヨーロッパなどで販売されてますけれども、先ほどのピアモルトというウイスキーに続いて販売されたものですね。And this, uh, this product is actually still being sold. You can buy it in Europe and other places as well.、Uh, it was done after the pure malt bottle that I showed earlier. 次のスライド、最後のスライド。Next slide, please. これはあの石井頃です。This is a, a, a stump. えー、私があの拾ってきた石なんですけれども、I, I found this stone. えー、これをですね紙の上に置くとペーパーウェイトになりますね。But if you put it on a paper like this, it becomes a paper weight. 私はこれを自分が自然としているこのことをあの考えてみると、価値とは何かということを考えさせられます。価値ですね。So... As I do something like this in a very natural way, it makes me think about what is value? What is the meaning of value? 私はその価値というものは人間が与えているものではなくて I, はい。環境の中から見,見,出してる見出してるっていうふうに受け取ります。It's something again that we sort of discover or find、uh, in the environment. これはその石,石を、えー、そのペーパーウェイトとして、えー、気がついたのは人間なんだという考え方ではないということですね。So、it's it's 石との関係でそれがこう見つかっているというようなそういう。もう一つの方法ですね。環境とか物とかとの,その関係をどういうふうに捉えるか。And of course, this、uh, question of how, how do we、uh, receive, how do we、uh, interpret or see、uh, the environment、uh, and our relationship with it, that, that's something very, very important. And today, well, there's not a lot of time. I think this is a good place to stop. Thank you so much, Takusan, for your、um, lovely uh, presentation. Um, I hope you'll,、uh, people in the audience are already、uh, submitting your questions to both Sarah and Taku.、Um, I'm going to, in the chat box, I'm going to start with a question now for Sarah in our interactive portion of today's webinar. Sarah, in your book, Designing Modern Japan, you wrote, quote, policymakers such as politicians and civil servants have been key actors in the design industries. By contrast,、uh, in the US, certainly, my personal understanding is that design is mostly left to the private sector. Can you pl please share some specific examples of how、um, policymakers have implemented、uh, design in Japan? Sure. So I'll start by saying I think this is a, you know, it's sort of a historical and a specific cultural, you know, sort of cultural thing. Partly coming out of, so in the book, I talk about,、um, and I mentioned a bit today in the presentation, just the importance of designers working in government in 19th century, in late 19th century Japan,、um, working with civil servants, working with、um, members of the national diet to put in place policies that would allow designers to flourish. Um, so, some of this was around bringing in new design ideas or having national design education.、Um, and they weren't the only, the only designers working with government to do this. So, there was a real move in the 19th century in a number of places、um, in Europe and in some cities in the US. So, like Providence, Rhode Island, Philadelphia as well,、um, to establish you know, sort of state design schools and really get people working in design for market, you know, for, to create better products.、Um, for, Communities to thrive economically.、Um, 
But I think designers were really effective in convincing people in government or having people in government see the power that design can have, whether that's selling products, whether it's creating better communities, um, whether, you know, community cohesion or strengthening communities economically. There was a real, I think, it's sort of a joint understanding. I mean, in the book, I, I suggest that this does really weaken, though, in the 1960s and 70s and that designers are able to work with corporations. Right. So there's a period of high economic growth and, you know, consumers have more money. People don't need to buy things to survive anymore. Right. From the 1970s, you've already got a refrigerator. You know, you've got an air conditioner. Now, what are you going to get? You want that amazing new thing. Right. And so designers have the opportunity to work with companies to create those new things. And the numbers of designers in censuses or in industry association counting just skyrockets in the 1970s and 80s. And I think that's actually not about government. That's about, um, you know, that's just about consumerism and the power of private companies. But I think there was an understanding in the sort of the 1890s or the 1870s running into the mid 20th century, an understanding in government that design was important. And I think it's also, you know, it's around today as well. Right. So now in, in the design world, we think a lot about strategy, services, experiences, community and community design is a really important aspect of design practice in Japan. Right. And that's understood by a lot of policymakers at local level and at national level. So the importance of design for helping communities to thrive, the importance of design for innovation as well. And that's a, that's not designed for selling stuff. That's designed to, you know, to move people, to get people involved, and to support people to think creatively. Thank you. My next question is for Takusan. Takusan, you shared with us how you came to appreciate a uh, specific nuance in the Japanese concept of hodo hodo, just enough, uh, in your approach, in your own approach to design. Can you please? Describe a specific experience or an encounter that facilitated or deepened your esteem for this idea of the uh, Well, to, to think back, uh, to go back a bit, uh, it happened when I was in middle school. My father bought me a wonderful bicycle. え、憧れていたギアチェンジができる自転車ですね。It was one of those multi-speed bicycles that everybody really really wanted. それで自転車屋さんにはアクセサリーがいっぱい売ってたんですね。And and the the bicycle shop would would also sell the accessories for that. それで自転車にバックミラーをまずつけました。For instance, first you put on a rearview mirror. それから電気でキラキラあの光るウィンカーもつけました。And then electrical uh, turn signal lights that blink. もういろいろなアクセサリーをつけまくりました。And then all sorts of they put all sorts of accessories on this bicycle. まるで昔のモッズのスクーターみたいにです。So like you know the the mods from the the, the 60s in the UK that kind of you know motor scooter kind of look. である時 自分はこの先どこへ行くんだろうって思いました。But at one point I thought yeah what what where can I go from here with this? そしてある時突然ですね、全てのものを取り外したんです。And then one day suddenly I decided to take everything off. え、自転車として最低限機能するものだけを残して、え、販売されていた時のパーツまで全部外しました。I wanted to strip it down to be just a basic bicycle so I took off all of the accessories that the bike shop had put on. それを壁に立てかけて私は感動したんですね。And then I that I really uh, was excited by that. I thought it was beautiful. How could a bicycle be so beautiful, I thought. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really think beauty, that word wasn't coming to mind, but I was so excited by it. So probably that was when I first felt uh, how wonderful it can be for something to be reduced to its its fundamental uh, basic parts. に辿り着いた 
のではないかと思います。And, and maybe that was the beginning of this long process through my own life and work、uh, that I arrived in, and at the importance of this concept of Hoda Hodo. I have, okay, thank you so much, Taksan, for sharing that very vivid memory.、Um, I have,、uh, I'm going to go to now、uh, some questions from the audience.、Um, and this could be、um, the first question could be answered by either or both、um, Sarah or Takusan. The question is In this highly globalized and interconnected world, is it possible main to maintain a truly Japanese character in design? うんはいはいあのー、日本らしいデザイン、うんあのー、ただ、えー、とーもう今西洋の文化いわいろいろな国の文化っていうものがもう、あのーえー、いわゆるうな,なんていうんですかこう、えー、全ての生活の隅々にまで、えー、染み渡っていると思うんですね。Um, yeah, when you think about... Japanese,、uh, Japanese character for design. Well, it's absolutely true that、uh, at this point,、uh, Western design influences have, have come through and percolated through to just about every aspect of life in Japan. ですからそれをこうすべて取り除くなんてことはあの意味がないですし、あの必要あの、えー、なんていうか無理無理なことなわけです。I think it, not only is it not necessary, it has no meaning to trying to remove those influences. It's also impossible. ただそういうふうにこう文化がこう、えー、こう、おえー、なんていうんですかね、えっ、ー、と、いろいろな文化を取り入れながらも、その日本らしい考え方に基づく。But I do think that、uh, even in this process of how those other influences are, are combined and brought into this design process, that that is also something that can be very, very Japanese. And we're in a, a capitalist society where we're You know, have so many things, we're, we're lots of things. And of course, one problem is within this capitalist system, you know, these effects on the environment, we really are, are at a point where we have to be concerned、uh, of whether the environment will actually be okay in the future. まあ、そ,ういうそういう時にあの皆様が研究されているその日本の江戸時代江戸時代に、えー、あったその文化みたいなものに立ち返ってですね、えー、その世界に向けて、えー、提案性のあるデザインをするっていうことは可能なのではないかと思います。And I think one strong possibility is something that most of you are also studying is、uh, the Edo period of Japan and the design thinking from that. That is something that possibly we can use will have a, can have a very positive in, impact. On、uh, how we design things going forward. Sarah, what do you think, Sarah? Sarah, I, I, can, I, Sarah can I ask you a question that, it, that relates to this?、Um, mm -hmm. You wrote that in the Meiji period, designers like Kamisaka Seka had sought to bring Rimpa style into their designs for modern life.、Mm -hmm. In the post war period, designers, including Yoko Tadanori, pursued a distinctly Japanese visual and object language in your, in your words. What do you identify as some of the hallmarks of a distinctly Japanese visual and object language? Okay, no, it's, it's a great question. And it's, you know, it's a question that people ask a lot. As a, I suppose, as a historian and as someone who works in design you know, and with design as well. Um, the way I see it might be less about a particular distinct language and more about approaches. And、um, yeah, it's, I guess, sort of more about approaches and the desire to find that that comes out at certain times.、Um, I think that you know, the, the late 19th century, the Meiji period, was really disruptive, right? You know, everything, not everything changed. Most people kept living like they had. But if you were a designer, you probably lost your client base. Right. And a lot of stuff around you is shifting, and the world as you know it, you know, the rules are not the same. And so, this well, what is Japanese design and what can be our design? Right. Not me as Japanese, but people speaking at the time. I think it's really valid to say, well, what could it be? And so, 
And I think the, you know, there are these moments of, you know, of globalization, right? And you're saying, oh, you know, here's Scandinavian design or here's American taste. Okay, what is distinctly Japanese? So it makes sense to look. Um, but I suppose from, you know, for myself, I, I wouldn't say, you know, these are things that are distinctly Japanese. I think it's more, it's, you know, why did, you know, the importance of people saying, well, I'm going to go and look for this. And I think sometimes, you know, Taku-san, as you've said, it's saying, well, what are these challenges and how could we face them? And is there something in tradition and in what the people, you know, the designers coming before you that have done that we can learn from now and that we can use in creative ways, right? And because of working in Japan and having cultural understandings around, you know, certain things, then you can say, okay, let's try this. That would be my, would be my thought. Thank you. We have a question from the audience uh, for Taksan. Um, could you discuss any religious or philosophical roots in uh, Japanese uh, aesthetics uh, uh, that relate to your idea of hodo hodo or holding back? Hmm? Uh, just a second. あの、もちろんあの、え、直接的ではないかもしれませんけども、そういうその、え、日本的な思想を、みたいなものは、え、そこにそこの方には流れてると思いますね。あ、yeah, uh, and it maybe is not in a direct way, but definitely uh, certain kinds of Japanese uh, thought or philosophy uh, is is flowing through this kind of thinking. でも日本の文化っていうのはその単純今お話いただいたように単純ではないのでえそのえいろいろなま思想もいろいろいくつもあるとは思いますけれど。And of course as we've been discussing, you know, Japanese society or our culture is not simple. Uh there's so many different kind of influences flowing through at the same time. 例えば自分を抑える uh, one important one is this notion of uh, self-restraint or, or to sort of um, you know uh, keep keep yourself uh, uh, down. I mean that's a hard way to say it, but yeah, self-restraint. Yeah, basically, instead of, you know, presenting yourself or pushing yourself outwardly, a similar kind of energy is used to contain yourself within. Hi, <laughs> Thank you. It's a very deep question and there's really not enough time to do it justice. And speaking of time, we are very much on the verge of running out of our time, but we have um, one minute for each of our presenters to share any final thoughts you may have um, uh, to wrap this uh, webinar up. Would you like to start, Sarah? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll start just again by thanking everyone um, and especially thanking you, Linda, for the thoughtful way that you framed the questions. Um, to thank the audience for thoughtful questions, and especially to thank Takusong for being so generous and sharing. I think in design, again, also we talk so much about affordances and objects that invite you to use them. And the importance of design is giving people agency or the, it's a design that invites people to finish the object or to be designers themselves. And so I love Takusa Hayu. The examples you gave really spoke to that, the power of design, which is to empower other people, empower the users to go and use them and do things and to be creative and make their lives beautiful and to support others as well. So I really, really appreciated how you shared that sensibility. I think it really spoke to the power of design as a practice. Thank you, Sarah. Taksan, can we have any final remarks from you? あの、今日は本当にあの、こういう、あの、貴重な時間を作っていただいたことに、あの、大変感謝してます。I I really uh am very grateful to be able to spend this incredibly valuable time with everyone. あの、世界はですね、あの、問題だらけ、え、ですけれども、あの、そのデザインで、あの、少しでも、あの、いい方向へ持っていけないだろうかと、あの、常に考えてはいます。The world is just full of all kinds of problems, but I think maybe that through design we can somehow find some paths forward to solving some of those problems. 
でこれからもいろんなその国,で国や地域のです、ね、考え方あみたいなものをです、ね、あの共有しながら、えー、これからあのどうしていくべきなのかということを皆さんと一緒に考えられたらあのと思います。I think it's really important that people from different regions or different countries actually share these ideas and share what they're thinking、uh, as a way to, to、uh, improve the situation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much.、Uh, I'm going to just wrap up、uh, this very thought provoking webinar.、Uh, thank you, Taksan. I think you helped us to appreciate、uh, the immense amount of consideration and thoughtfulness that you put into thinking about your design and thoughtfulness in thinking about the person who's going to use your design. I don't know that,、um, I wish that all designers in the world could follow your example, but I'm, I'm not convinced by that looking around daily life in the United States.、Uh, but thank you so much for helping us to appreciate、um, the, the invisibility of the thoughtfulness that you pour into your designs. We really appreciate this. And Thera, Sarah, thank you so much for helping us understand. Um, the incredible versatility and the alacrity with which so many designers in Japan adapted to、uh, massive historical changes. As you say, the shift from Tokugawa to Meiji was massive、um, with the influx of Western lifestyles and, and industrialization. And they, it's really remarkable how they managed, with some government support, to. Respond, respond to these changes. I hope、um, for the audiences, you will refer to the titles of their respective books,、um, Designing Modern Japan and Just Enough Design, written by Sarah Teasley and Takusato. If you're interested in learning more about、um, the ideas and designs of our respective presenters, and you, know, you will be receiving.、Uh, Uh, a questionnaire shortly for those of you who have participated. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll、um, fill them out. Just take a moment to fill them out so that we can keep improving our presentations. And thank you so much, Takusan. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Aki Nakanishi,、uh, Portland Japanese Garden, and Japan Society for hosting this memorable conversation. <laughs>